everyone, it's Alex, and today I'm here to do my July reading wrap-up. This was definitely the month of new releases for me, between reading like recent stuff that came out, but also a few ARCs that I got that are publishing within the next few months. And up first, I wanted to talk about Assembly by Natasha Brown, which I think is already out in the UK, but comes out here in the States in September. This short novel follows a Black British woman as she's on her way to her white boyfriend's family estate for the weekend as he's formally presenting her as his girlfriend. Meanwhile, our narrator is also having some great professional success with her work, but all of that kind of falls short whenever she gets some unexpected news that really makes her pause and wonders how she got to this point in her life. And all in all, this book was exactly what I thought it was going to be, but also exactly what I was in the mood for. Being about a perceptive woman who is aware of the social and economic implications of her parameters within her opportunities in the world. But to me, what's most successful about this book is definitely the way in which the structure kind of comes alive and manifesting or representing exactly this narrator's intrusive thoughts. As to me, the narrator becomes increasingly more apathetic towards life while trying to still be observant of acknowledging this constant disassociation that she feels. And I think the sparseness of the writing when thinking back about the form of structure with this book is really effective because it doesn't try to create an illusion or become mysterious or feels like it's withholding anything. Rather, I think it's a great coordination of the narrator trying to secure her own autonomy for her preference of this privacy. But yeah, I really liked this book and I think it's just brief enough to feel like it's manageable with how it's choosing to be so short. Because of its topical subject matter, especially in relation to race, I feel like is a way of presenting itself as a recurring rhetoric with how like people are presented, I feel like, nowadays. And that's definitely me reading too much into it, but you can read Assemble Yourself and determine if it's for you. Another arc that I read this month is Trust by Domenico Star Nun and is translated from the Italian by Jhumpa Lahiri. I remember hearing about this author before whenever his book Ties came out, which was like well received and stuff, but I've also heard that it's kind of a loose sort of following between his books talking to each other, with Trust being the latest contribution to his literary world. I've also heard about this author with a few things about him from Rebecca at Rebecca Eats Books with some information I'm choosing to ignore in a very no thoughts, head empty kind of way. And I would say overall that I liked this book, but I think more so based on its execution versus its content. In this novel, we follow a man named Pietro who's kind of a player as he's talking about two women he's been in love with at two different stages of his life. But initially, what admittedly feels like initial immature impressions of why he's pursuing these women, to me, Pietro does become earnestly more vulnerable towards acknowledging his own growing relationship with women and just trying to understand women better. But what made the novel so interesting to me is that with Pietro's professional life, with him being a writer, it really did feel like it was a balancing act of how much that was affecting his own interpersonal relationships. Specifically, there's a part where Pietro does acknowledge that one of the feelings he hates the most is his inability to feel like he's successfully connected with someone. But Starnone doesn't write Pietro as this victimized person or persona of wanting constant attention. It's really a great balance of this self-righteousness while also maintaining this possible idea that Pietro is so self-indulgent that he doesn't realize or has ever heard of the phrase, it's not that deep. But it's really Pietro's decision-making of his balancing act that I mentioned earlier between trying to assess the pros and cons of these two women that's surprisingly really captivating. I could really describe it it would also be that, in my mind, Pietro could also be a very disillusioned F-boy. And this might be a controversial assessment, but I would feel like Starnone is the male version of Rachel Cusk. Both of them are writers that really value the interiority of their characters and how they navigate through the world and how their outside relationships really feel like a reflection of their own internal capabilities with adjusting to the world. So I would be really curious to read more of Starnone's work, especially with Ties that published a few years ago. But again, with Trust, it does come out 
I think in October of this year by Europa Editions. Up next, I wanted to talk about a pretty hyped memoir that I really loved, and that's Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner. And if Michelle Zahner's name sounds familiar at all, she is the artist behind the music group Japanese Breakfast. I would classify ultimately this as a celebrity memoir. And I usually have my own reservations about approaching celebrity memoir, but with this one, it really knocked it out of the park for me. The first chapter in this book actually shares the title of the memoir itself. Having been published a few years ago, I want to say in The New Yorker, and then really taking off, which is how this book deal happened, or at least that's what I think my cursory research told me. And having known that, that this memoir is just an extension of that essay that was published, I was worried that its length was a way to just kind of pull things together to make a complete package. But with such a streamlined narrative that is both touching and very tender with moments that are very raw, but also like shocking in terms of her own relationships with her family, I was really impressed with just how much control Zahner had. The memoir follows Zahner in her mid-twenties whenever she finds out that her mother is in poor health, opening the doors for Zahner's reflections on her Korean-American upbringing. And with this premise of Zahner's mother dying, it really feels like it opens up all opportunities of Zahner making this such a concise and restrained form of confession with the details that she shares. For example, Zahner describing that her father openly admits that he's not sure if he and Zahner have a relationship anymore whenever her mother will die. And even beyond her immediate family, Zahner also details some horrible, very misfortunate things going on with people sort of in the parameters of her life, like her boyfriend who was poorly, unfortunately, assaulted just randomly for doing something that didn't feel like it was justifiable. Not that people need a reason to be attacked, but no matter what it is, I feel like with Zahner's sense of control that I mentioned, it really does feel like the memoir is told so gracefully and so expertly in its own way, to which Zahner treats herself more like a character in a novel. And sure, there are sometimes parts that I feel are a little ham-fisted, like Zahner making sure to note the relationship between her Korean upbringing with Korean food, which is certainly important, but it does feel more something like a narrative push deemed by the publishers or something. And sometimes the symbolism can get a little wincy with some images that feel a little equivalent to the phrase, I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding. But all in all, I would say this memoir is the whole package. And if you're looking for a great nonfiction book, especially if you're getting into nonfiction, or maybe if you just read fiction more in general, I would highly recommend picking this up. Another great memoir, but maybe a little living in Crying in H Mart's Shadow for Me is Made in China by Anna Q which comes out, I think, even next week in August. This book has Q recount her childhood up until her adulthood as she's been living in New York City, but also while her parents have owned a sweatshop. As Q's reason for living in the States is by having the sweatshop because her parents also immigrated from China, and Q is finding herself, even as a teenager, working up to 40 hours a week at the sweatshop. And it's clear even to a young age in which Q realizes that it's very unfamiliar to have a childhood surrounded by labor, but also very abusive tones. And with this evolution of Q becoming more familiar with life, not only as she's growing up, I really do like that Q told this story in a chronological order. Although unfortunately, choosing to do this in a chronology does have some sections fall a little flat in comparison to others. Specifically, the second section, because there's four sections in this book, is dedicated to Q going off to college, which really feels like a blip, as we feel like we get what's a quick summary so that way Q can speed up to talking about her adulthood working at this startup. And to me, with these noticeable differences in the strength or quality of the writing between these sections, it sometimes does feel like the cracks are opening to lend itself to emphasizing this triumphal narrative which memoir sometimes leans toward, which is basically any moment where the memoirist is trying to let the reader feel secure in giving something that's probably unfortunate happening, but then maybe by the end of the chapter talking about a reflective moment that is a bit more uplifting or inspirational. And while I think these can be astute observations, I think by digging deeper it can show some intention other than trying to be a triumphal narrative. Specifically, I thought about how maybe this second section I was talking about that feels a bit poor or not as strong as the rest of the book 
could just be Q's way of symbolizing how much her childhood really caused her some trauma to feel like she was just going through the motions of her early adulthood. As Q herself does describe literally that her body felt like it was an autopilot, so maybe with her college experience, it was a matter of just feeling like she was adapting to a new situation, favoring out, working at a sweatshop for 40 hours a week, and now being a full-time student. And even following this pattern of behavior into her adulthood whenever she's working at the startup, trying to persuade investors to basically not have her lose her job. And finally, with my last example being the very first section, which is my favorite, ultimately being most of Q's childhood, she paints a portrait of her family being this very villainous archetype, which I was thinking about how in the beginning of this book it did feel a little kitschy because it was feeling a bit Cinderella-esque, but when I think about it, if you're someone writing an adult perspective about your own childhood, maybe it makes the most sense to feel like that was a coping mechanism of feeling like your parents are the villain and that you're trying to be someone that's escaping this horrible situation, which it justifyingly is a very horrible situation that Q was in. And to pull it all together, which is really what really sold me on the memoir whenever I feel like I finished it and realized I really liked it, is how Q really assesses where is she up until this moment in life where she's even writing this book about how she feels being a Chinese American woman. And most effectively, perhaps, what does that mean for Q thinking about her own mother, who is clearly the main star of this memoir? Made in China comes out in early August, so I highly recommend checking it out. And last but not least, for my July wrap-up, I have Filthy Animals by Brandon Taylor. Unlike Taylor's previous work, which is the novel Real Life, which is super buzzy, Filthy Animals is actually a collection of short stories. Similar to real life, Taylor does include many characters within Filthy Animals that feel like they have this distinct realization of having a preference for loneliness. But Taylor also does a really great job at making sure not to depict this sense of isolation as a favorable quality or trying to romanticize it. Instead, I feel like what Taylor does so well is that within this cloud of loneliness that once the characters finally get it, they realize just quite how infinite the capacity of one's loneliness can be since there's no one really else to hold them accountable for their actions or thoughts or behavior, especially in a world that seems to lean more toward how to best prepare yourself for being alone versus not alone, with the only remedy seeming to be ways in which you can find organic means of justifying being with someone, whether or not these stories describe friendships or also romantic relationships. Unfortunately, the problem for me with this collection is that I feel like they never quite manage to get past their initial themes by taking that plunge into deeper introspection, which is surprising because I feel like the prime themes in here are things like insecurity and intimacy, which I feel like are great starting places for allowing introspection, but I feel like what gets in the way is that between this sense of secrecy that different characters have by keeping their motivations from other people, whenever dialogue does occur between characters, it almost feels like it causes things to take a pause or that the momentum feels really stifled. And as someone that doesn't mind passive writing at all, this is such a letdown for me, as characters often talk in circles about some sort of hidden metaphor, to which then I realize that like people <laughs> don't talk like this at all. And I'm willing to suspend my disbelief, of course, whenever it comes to conversations or dialogue like this, but I feel like I'm getting to know the dialogue first before I know the characters behind the dialogue, which I know it's kind of crazy to say because you might think that the dialogue can give characteristics, but I dare say that sometimes this book even lacks a sense of personality or distinction between characters in different stories. But I think the redeeming quality of this collection, and really just Taylor in general, is that I think he really does have such a distinct and clear voice whenever it comes to what he wants to write about. Because these stories still don't feel anything like MFA workshoppy to me, so it does feel like I'm reading very skilled writing. And the genuine tone to these stories, like overall, I think is effective in manifesting this internalized bleakness. It's just disappointing that these characters feel more like dolls in a dollhouse pretending to be people. And maybe that's the point of it all, I don't really know, but what I do like is trying to discover the seed that Taylor plants within his characters and watching them evolve. Again, as I read and really enjoyed Real Life by Brandon Taylor, 
being able to observe the character Wallace within that story much reminded me of the interconnected stories in Filthy Animals where we follow a character named Lionel. So it's no surprise to me that my favorite story or stories in this collection happen to be the ones about Lionel as we followed him through, I think, four or five stories. And what I love is that where we leave Lionel is actually so unclear. And without spoiling anything, it's just a matter of Lionel, like the conscious decision to try to feel open to someone and what that means. And I wish that our my relationship or my time with the character of Lionel was longer so I really enjoyed that stuff so it makes me really hopeful for the next novel that Taylor comes out with. So ultimately much like how I feel with the dates that I go on I feel like it's more me than them. In this case being that I'm sure Filthy Animals is a great book for some people out there that maybe like different aspects of Taylor's writing but I much prefer his novels. So those were all the books I read for July and if you read any of these I would love to know what you think although I'm sure with you know at least maybe even half of these where they haven't published yet. I hope if you do pick up those ones that you enjoy them as well. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.